All right, let's look at these questions together. Number one, how do you describe Mrs. Smith? Why does Anne admire her so much? Um, we get the story of how Anne knows Mrs. Smith on page 100. And then on the next page, we get the story of uh, Mrs. Smith's life after Anne and what she's currently like now. So, page 100. Miss Hamilton, now Mrs. Smith had shown, today we spell this with an O, shown her kindness in one of those periods of her life when it had been most valuable. Anne had gotten unhappy to school. Remember, she went to boarding school, grieving for the loss of a mother whom she had dearly loved, feeling her separation from home, and suffering as a girl of 14 of strong sensibility and not high spirits must suffer at such a time. And Miss Hamilton, three years older than herself, but still from her want of near relations and a settled home remaining another year at school. So Miss Hamilton is 17, but she's still at school because she lacks, for want of means she lacks, Family, near relations means family. And a settled home doesn't have a family, doesn't have a home. Therefore, she is still at school. And at school, she had been useful and good to Anne in a way which had considerably lessened her misery and could never be remembered with indifference. So every time Anne remembers her, she remembers her Fondly. OK, so that's what we know. That's what Anne knows about Mrs. Smith. Then we get what happened to Miss uh, Miss. At the time she was Miss Hamilton, right? And then we get the story of what happened to her after she left school. Miss Hamilton had left school and had married not long afterwards, was said to have married a man of fortune. And this was all that Anne had known of her till now. Uh, she meets her again. Next page. She was a widow and poor. Bum, bum, bum. This sentence is very surprising because just on the previous page, we read that she married a man of fortune. And we turn the page and the first sentence says she was a widow and poor. What the hell happened? Her husband had been extravagant spending lots and lots of money. Uh, we still use this word today, right? Extravagant means very fancy, very expensive. Uh, today we don't use this for people. We use this for events and for things. And at his death, about two years before, had left his affairs dreadfully involved. Affairs here means business. Involved here means complicated. She had had difficulties of every sort to contend with, and in addition to these distresses, had been afflicted with a severe rheumatic fever. Today we call this arthritis, guan jie yin, which finally settling in her legs had made her for the present a cripple. Today, we don't use the word cripple. We say that she is disabled. She had come to Bath on that account uh, because Bath, the name of the town is named for the Bath waters that are supposed to have healing properties. So that's why she's here. Uh, on that account means for this reason and was now in lodgings in a place to stay near the hot baths living in a very humble way, unable even to afford herself the comfort of a servant, and of course almost excluded from society. So that is her current situation. Um, and yet, when Anne meets her, she doesn't meet a poor, bitter, disabled widow. 
Instead, Anne found in Mrs. Smith the good sense and agreeable manners which she had almost ventured to depend on from when they were younger, and a disposition to converse, which means a tendency or a habit or a character to converse, conversation, talk, and be cheerful beyond her expectation. Neither the dissipations of the past. Dissipation means ruin, so like spending too much money. Neither the dissipations of the past, and she had lived very much in the world, uh, which means that she had indeed uh, spent a lot of money to, to experience many things in the world and, and like bought many things. She was very much part of the world. In modern English, um, this would be matched by an M dash here. These two punctuation marks should be symmetrical. Uh, so you can have a comma here uh, in both places, or you can have an M dash in both places. So even though Mrs. Smith was, you know, spent a lot of money, did participate in the world, nor the restrictions of the present, she can't walk. Neither sickness nor sorrow seem to have closed her heart or ruined her spirits. So whether it's her past or her present, whether it's her mind or her body, nothing has made her a sadder person. In the course of a second visit, she talked with great openness and Anne's astonishment increased. She could scarcely imagine a more cheerless situation in itself than Mrs. Smith's. She had been very fond of her husband. She had buried him. She had been used to affluence, which means wealth. It was gone. Uh, and again, in modern English, we would not put a comma here. A dash is enough. She had no child to connect her with life and happiness again. Remember all the way back in chapter one, Lady Elliot? Not very happy, but she cared enough about her children and her friends so that when it came time to die, she felt a little bit connected to life. Well, here it says Mrs. Smith has no child to connect her with life and happiness. No relations, family, to assist in the arrangement of perplexed affairs. Again, perplexed means complicated. No health to make all the rest supportable. The idea here is if she's healthy, then at least she can try to solve the other problems but she doesn't even have health. Her accommodations were limited to a noisy parlor. A parlor is where you meet guests, cutting, and a dark bedroom behind with no possibility of moving from one to the other without assistance. So Mrs. Smith is living in a two bedroom apartment, not bedroom, a two room apartment. Parlor, bedroom, 客厅卧室, 两厅. And she can't even move between them because she can't walk. Uh, she needs assistance, which there was only one servant in the house to afford, and she never quitted the house but to be conveyed into the warm bath. So she has to share the only servant that she needs, and she never leaves the house unless it's to go take the healing bath. And yet she's still such a like pretty happy person. How could it be? Uh, yeah, OK, so in spite of all this, Anne had reason to believe that Mrs. Smith had moments only of languor and depression. Languor means boredom. Depression means depression. So Throughout her day, Mrs. Smith only sometimes feels these negative emotions compared to 
hours of occupation and enjoyment. Occupation means she has something to do. How could it be? She watched, observed, reflected, and finally determined that this was not a case of fortitude or of resignation only. So it's not only because Mrs. Smith is strong in mind, it's not only because Mrs. Smith had accepted her situation. A submissive spirit might be patient. A strong understanding would supply resolution, which means determination. But here was something more. Here was that elasticity of mind. Uh, elasticity here means flexibility. Uh, able to accommodate changes. So here Anne is saying Mrs. Smith has elasticity of mind. She is very able to uh, change how she thinks about things. The disposition to be comforted. The power of turning readily from evil to good taking something bad and turning it into something good in her head. And of finding employment which carried her out of herself, which was from nature alone. So it's not something that Mrs. Smith alone could work on. The elasticity of mind um, has to come from nature. It's not something you can learn. It was the choicest gift of heaven. Choicest means most valuable. Today we still use this word when we talk about meat. When you're buying meat from a butcher, uh, tofu, and you select parts of the animal body, you if you select the best and most expensive parts, those are the choicest cuts. And Anne viewed her friend as one of those instances in which by a merciful appointment, so fate, merciful means kind, right? So by a kind fate, it seems designed to counterbalance almost every other want. In other words, uh, her friend suffers so much, but fate gave her this personality to help her balance out everything that she has suffered. So this is why Anne admires her so much. Throughout this terrible suffering, Mrs. Smith is still able to see and focus on the positive parts of her life. Question two, the value of gossip. So Mrs. Smith defends the idea of gossip. Um, so this is the bottom of page 102. The idea is that Nurse Rook doesn't just come to take care of Mrs. Smith. She also works in several other houses around town so she can hear what people are talking about. And she passes gossip to Mrs. Smith. So here's how Mrs. Smith thinks about this. Everybody's heart is open, you know, when they have recently escaped from severe pain or are recovering the blessing of health. So when they have been hurt and are recovering, they often open their hearts. And Nurse Rook thoroughly understands when to speak. She is a shrewd, intelligent, sensible woman. Hers is a line. Line means a line of work. Hers is a line for seeing human nature. And she has a fund. Today we would say a wealth. She has a wealth of good sense and observation, which as a companion make her infinitely superior to thousands of those who have who having only received the best education in the world, know nothing worth attending to. 
So here she's saying the fact that Nurse Rook talks with so many sick people gives her a better understanding of people than uh, if than you can get from going to a really good school. In other words, according to Mrs. Smith, you guys shouldn't be sitting here. You guys should be going out there to gossip and you will learn more about humanity. Call it gossip if you will. But when Nurse Rook has half an hour's leisure to bestow on me, so when she can spend half an hour with me, she is sure to have something to relate, something to tell that is entertaining and profitable. Profitable means useful, something that Anne or Mrs. Smith can learn from. Something that makes one know one's species better. It helps Mrs. Smith better understand humanity. One likes to hear what is going on, to be au fait as to the newest modes of being trifling and silly. As the footnote says, au fait means fashionable. So here is a second idea, right? The first idea was about human nature. The second idea is it can be fun. We like to see how people uh, act in silly ways uh, in their daily life. To me, who lives so much alone, her conversation, I assure you, is a treat. So the value of gossip, do you agree, why or why not? I talked with one group about this question and they agree. They agree that gossip can sometimes be fun and can sometimes give you um, more knowledge about humans and uh, how they behave. But not always, right? There's also gossip that is just bad. It's bad for you, it's bad for your friend you're talking to, and it's bad for the person that you're talking about. This is called malicious gossip. But not all gossip is bad. Question three, Anne's criticism of Mr. Elliot doesn't make sense. It's 106 to 107, so bottom of 106. So first we have the good, right? Whenever you are going to criticize someone or something, you should start with the good and then move into the bad. Um, because in English, usually if we put something near the end, it will receive more attention. It will have more emphasis. So the good. Though they had now been acquainted a month, she could not be satisfied that she really knew his character, that he was a sensible man, an agreeable man, that he talked well, professed good opinions, seemed to judge properly, and as a man of principle. This was all clear enough. He certainly knew what was right nor could she fix on any one article of moral duty evidently transgressed. OK, so to fix on. Means to focus on and here it means and could not find. Article of moral duty means something that he should do because it is right. Evidently means obviously, transgressed means broken. So this sentence means Anne could not find a single case where Mr. Elliot did not follow his moral duty. But yet she would have been afraid to answer for his conduct. To answer for means to be responsible for. So even though Mr. Elliot looks like the perfect guy, Anne would still not want to take responsibility for his actions. She distrusted the past, if not the present. So yes, in the present, Mr. Elliot looks great, but something about the past. The names 
which occasionally dropped of former associates. So people that Mr. Elliot used to know. The allusions to former practices and pursuits. Sometimes Mr. Elliot talks about things that he used to do. Practice and pursuit here both just mean activity. All of this suggested suspicions not favorable of what he had been. So these little clues tell and that maybe Mr. Elliot was not always this perfect. She saw that there had been bad habits. That Sunday traveling had been a common thing. So in a strictly Christian society, Sunday is a day of rest. You're not supposed to do anything serious on Sunday. If you go out for like a picnic, that's not traveling. Traveling means traveling for business. And you're not supposed to do business on Sunday. That there had been a period of his life and probably not a short one when he had been at least careless on all serious matters. And though he might now think very differently, who could answer for the true sentiments of a clever, cautious man grown old enough to appreciate a fair character? Character here means reputation. As the footnote and Taylor Swift tell you. So the idea here is, yes, he looks perfect, but he also is very careful. How do you know that he is perfect? How could it ever be ascertained that his mind was truly cleansed? Cleansed just means is now clean. Ascertained, if you see like the structure of this word. In the middle, you have the word certain. So ascertain means to make certain. So this sentence means how could she ever be sure that his mind was now truly clean? Mr. Elliot was rational, discreet, which means careful, polished, which means he presents himself well, but he was not open. There was never any burst of feeling, any warmth of indignation or delight at the evil or good of others. So whether he hears that somebody is a good person or somebody is a bad person, that somebody did something good or somebody did something bad, his reactions are all perfectly still and smooth. No emotion. Very strange. This to Anne was a decided imperfection. Decided means certain, like she's sure. Her early impressions were incurable. They could not be changed. They could not be improved. Right, they could not be. Cured. She prized the frank, which means honest the open hearted, the eager character beyond all others. As we discovered last week when she was talking with Mr. Elliot about what is good company. Warmth and enthusiasm did captivate her still. These are the things that grab her heart. She felt that she could so much more depend upon the sincerity of those who sometimes looked or said a careless or a hasty thing than of those whose presence of mind, so they're always careful, never varied, whose tongue never slipped. So Anne is saying she could depend more on somebody if they were sometimes careless. But if somebody is always perfect all the time, and cannot really depend on that person. Mr. Elliot was too generally agreeable. Various, which means different, as were the tempers in her father's house, 
he pleased them all. So even though in Sir Walter's household, different people had different characters and thought about things in different ways, Mr. Elliot could still make all of them happy. He endured too well, stood too well with everybody. To stand well with somebody means you make them think that you are good. So he's saying he makes everybody like him. He had spoken to Anne with some degree of openness of Mrs. Clay. Had appeared completely to see what Mrs. Clay was about and to hold her in contempt. Uh, so if you remember, Mrs. Clay is the common lady who is the friend of Elizabeth and Anne. Uh, and Lady Russell are kind of scared that maybe Mrs. Clay would seduce Sir Walter. Uh, and so they she Anne had talked about this with Mr. Elliot. Mr. Elliot seemed like he agreed. He also seemed like he didn't like Mrs. Clay. And yet Mrs. Clay found him as agreeable as anybody. Even when he has told Anne he doesn't like Mrs. Clay, he still makes Mrs. Clay like him. So if we boil down Anne's criticism of Mr. Elliot, it is that she doesn't know what he's like underneath the surface. I talked with one group about this question and they think this makes sense, especially if Anne were ever to consider marrying Mr. Elliot. You know, you're supposed to spend the rest of your life with your marriage partner, your spouse. So how scary would it be if you marry someone that you think is the perfect spouse and then after you get married, they suddenly stop pretending and you finally discover what kind of person they are after you marry them. That's kind of too late, so it does seem like Anne is being very sensible here. But she's the only person who thinks this. If we keep reading. Lady Russell again saw either less or more than her young friend, for she saw nothing to excite distrust. Lady Russell trusts Mr. Elliot, uh, trusts Mr. Elliot completely. She just thinks he's perfect. She could not imagine a man more exactly what he ought to be than Mr. Elliot. So even in in thinking about people's behavior and personality, Anne is also in the minority. Most people simply look at how they behave and judge the behavior only. Anne is thinking about what is the person like. Question four. Uh, will Louisa's fall really affect every aspect of her life? Page 111. So this is when Anne is thinking about the fact that Louisa will now marry Captain Bennick. Two people that she thought were very different, but. Um, now Louisa Musgrove has changed. Turned into a person of literary taste. Remember, Bennick also likes to read. And sentimental reflection. Was amusing, but she had no doubt of its being so. Uh, and believes this news. The day at Lyme, the fall from the cob might influence Louisa's health her nerves, which means her mental health, her courage, her character to the end of her life as thoroughly as it appeared to have influenced her fate. Fate here means her marriage. So just like the accident has led her to marry Benick, the accident has also changed all of these parts of her life. Now she is not perfectly healthy, uh, healthy. Now her mental health is also not as before. Now maybe she is not so 
uh, headstrong and stubborn. Maybe she's more careful and her personality has changed, right? She is now sentimental, loves literature. So uh, I talked with one group about this question and they agree. Basically, like every aspect of life is here, right? Physical health, mental health, spirit in terms of courage and personality in terms of character. Uh, and then you have the marriage is also here. That's everything. Uh, so yes, the fall at Lyme does seem to have changed Louisa in every aspect. But this is not like Louisa just hit her head and became a different person, right? All of this stuff happens because Louisa is lying in bed for a long time near Captain Bennick, and they have talked a lot and shared ideas. Right? It's not like she hit her head and became a different person. It's because the accident, she's recovering, and during the recovery, she started to change. And question five, why does, uh, or do you agree with Anne that Wentworth still loves her and what is the evidence? Let's go to page 121, 21, yes. So they are at the concert and they run into each other. And Anne says, oh, I heard you're not going to marry Louisa. And, and he's like, yes. In fact, it's going to be Captain Benwick. Uh, so here, Wentworth is talking about the marriage between Louisa and Benwick. Um, again, we start with a good thing. I wish them happy. I rejoice, which means celebrate. They have no difficulties. Uh, people, everybody is great. Everything is very much in favor. And then he stops. And after the good comes the bad. I confess that I do think there is a disparity, which means a difference, a gap. Too great a disparity and in a point no less essential than mind. So went with this saying in this very important part, their minds do not seem to match. I regard Louisa Musgrove as a very amiable, sweet tempered girl and not deficient in understanding. So she has a brain on on her shoulders. But Benick is something more. He is a clever man, a reading man. And I confess that I do consider his attaching himself to her with some surprise. So remember, he was probably going to marry Louisa. Now he's saying that Benick is better than Louisa. Uh, and then he also has some criticism of Benick. Remember, Benick was going to marry Fanny Harville, right? Uh, and then Fanny is like, no, we're poor. Marry me when we're, we have money. And Benick goes out to sea and then Fanny dies. And now Benick is heartbroken. But then Benick falls in love with Louisa and Wentworth can't believe it. He says, a man like him in his situation with a heart pierced, uh, Sichuan, wounded, almost broken. Fanny Harville was a very superior creature, so a very good person. And his attachment to her was indeed attachment. A man does not recover from such a devotion of the heart to such a woman. He ought not. He should not. He does not. Of course, at this point, he's no longer just talking about Benick. He's talking about himself. And his feelings for Anne. And then, just at this moment, he went no farther. He stopped talking. And at this moment, Anne, who, in spite of the agitated voice, the excited voice, 
in which the latter part had been uttered, had been spoken. And in spite of all the various noises of the room, the almost ceaseless slam of the door. So people keep going in and out. The door keeps on closing. And ceaseless buzz of persons walking through had distinguished every word. She had caught every word. Was struck. She was shocked. Was gratified. She was happy. Confused and beginning to breathe very quick and feel a hundred things in a moment. Uh, and then she started to feel like maybe she should say something to continue the conversation. And the only thing that she could think of to say is some banal pleasantry about Lyme. She says, you were a good while at Lyme, I think. You spent a long time there, right? Uh, and then Wentworth gives the polite response, like why he was there so long, what happened, what he did. And then Anne says, I should very much like to see Lyme again. You know, I want to go back one day. Uh, and Wentworth is very surprised. He says, indeed. Uh, today, I think instead of an exclamation point, we would probably put a question mark. So it would mean something like, really? Indeed, I should not have supposed that you could have found anything in Lyme to inspire such a feeling. In modern English, I never thought that you would think positively about Lyme. The horror and distress you were involved in, the stretch of mind, which means using her brain, the wear of spirits, how her spirits were tired, uh, now, of course, he's talking about Louisa's accident uh, and Anne's role in taking care of the situation. I should have thought your last impressions of Lyme must have been strong disgust. And then Anne's reply, the last few hours were certainly very painful, replied Anne. But when pain is over, the remembrance of it often becomes a pleasure. So again, she's also not just talking about Lyme. She's also talking about herself and her relationship with Wentworth. Uh, and then the important people come in and their conversation stops. She is divided from Wentworth. They, they're separated. Uh, and then she starts thinking about what she just learned. She had learned in the last 10 minutes more of his feelings toward Louisa, more of all his feelings than she dared to think of. And she gave herself up to the demands of the party, blah, blah, blah. She was so happy she didn't worry about that conversation. Notice that the sentence does not stop with this exclamation point. You probably learned somewhere in English class that an exclamation point or a question mark ends a sentence. Not true, not always. Uh, so like she's just really happy. Do we have the description? I think it's the next page, right? Yes. Page 123. So during the rest of that concert, Anne saw nothing, thought nothing of the brilliancy of the room. So it could be talking about all the important people or all the bright lights. She doesn't care. Her happiness was from within. Her eyes were bright and her cheeks glowed, but she knew nothing about it. She was thinking only of the last half hour and as they passed to their seats, her mind took a hasty range over it. She thought back over uh, the last half hour. His choice of subjects for conversation, his expressions, and still more his manner and look had been such as she could see in only one light. She could only explain it one way. 
his opinion of Louisa Musgrove's inferiority, that Louisa is actually worse. An opinion which he had seemed solicitous to give. He was eager to share this idea. His wonder, which means surprise. Wonder actually is bad in this uh, in this time period. Wonder is a bad thing. Uh, so he's like amazed. How could it possibly be like this? His wonder at Captain Bennick, his feelings as to a first strong attachment. Sentences begun, which he could not finish. His half averted eyes always uh, like half the time not able to look at Anne. And more than half expressive glance. And when he did look at Anne, it expressed so many emotions. All, all. I really love this. I really love this comma right here, right? All, all declared that he had a heart returning to her at least. Notice she doesn't say at last. She says at least. So she's not saying, ah, he loves me. She's saying maybe it's possible he loves her. Maybe that anger, resentment, avoidance were no more. And they were succeeded, which means followed, not merely by friendship and regard, regard means respect, but by the tenderness of the past. Yes, some share of the tenderness of the past. I also love this. It looks like she's repeating herself, but she's not. She's modifying herself from the tenderness to some share of the tenderness. So at first she thinks, oh, he feels exactly the same about me as he used to. And then she pauses and says, yes, maybe he feels a little bit like he used to feel about me. So like just like above when she's repeating the all, right? She's like, uh, She's trying to control her feelings. All of these thoughts are powered by her feelings, but at this moment she realizes maybe I'm getting carried away. Maybe I, I need to be more careful and rational about this. So she changes from exactly how he used to feel to kind of like how he used to feel. She could not contemplate the change as implying less. All of this evidence could mean nothing else. He must love her. Uh, so I talked with one group about this question. They agree with Anne's evaluation, especially this group focused on the fact that Wentworth could not look at Anne half the time. So it's not just what he says, which Anne also considers, right? His subject of conversation. It's how he says it. Not able to be direct and straightforward and always look Anne in the eye means that he has some feelings he's not willing to share with Anne right now. Uh, because at this point, you know, Anne has never been sure of Wentworth's feelings for her. Now she knows. But on the other side, Wentworth also thinks that Anne doesn't want to marry him. And this side, Wentworth has not learned the truth yet. Right? The whole story is these two exes still love each other, but they think that the other person hates them. So Anne now knows that Wentworth doesn't hate her anymore. But Wentworth doesn't know that Anne doesn't hate him anymore. So we're only halfway there. And to finish the other half, we only have four chapters left. So as you can imagine, the last four chapters are quite exciting. All right, that's today's discussion. Do you have questions or other thoughts? See, this is why I love this book so much. It's just a really great book, very, very romantic, let's say. OK, yeah, so finish the book uh, and we'll discuss the last four chapters next week. 
after the discussion, I will introduce the final exam. And then week 18 will be a movie. Uh, completely unrelated movie. 